We now have our expert panel, um, and so I'm going to move into comprehensive Duchenne care. Um, uh, so comprehensive Duchenne care is so, so important, I think, to all of us to just be reassured that the care we're seeking is, in fact, the right kind of care at the right time for the person we care about. So um, a as you all know, and as Anne has stated, this is not just a, di a disease that affects skeletal muscle. Every other system in the body is affected by Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and in that, this is the sole reason or the single most important reason why an interdisciplinary care team is necessary to provide the best care and opportunities for treatment for our boys and some girls. The care guides, as I mentioned earlier, we have the family guide. Um, this is something we partnered with MDA on, World Duchenne Organization and the uh, Treaty NMD. Uh, to develop because the publications actually are pretty um, significant in, in their number of pages and in their breadth and in the time it takes to read them. So we created a family guide that really enhances your ability to go through the important points of this, understand them, and then be able to discuss them with your primary health care providers. Um, we have a new diagnosis and early care guide online. This is for people with a relatively new diagnosis and sort of takes you through the basic steps I think we all know this is a journey, and we need help along the way. So the diagnosis in early care is just that, how to start off right, how to think about what you need, the questions to ask, how to get support, how to think about care. We also have imperatives for health care providers, and these are really helpful also in Spanish for your primary health care providers just to give, again, the real imperatives. What are the things they need to think about and prioritize? We have also Education Matters, and this has been updated this year. I think one of the most difficult things is for teachers to understand what is Duchenne and what, how do they think about it, what they need to do about it to enhance this individual's educational process. So I recommend Education Matters. It's a great help and a great support for both parents and teachers. Emergency care. Boy, um, never a greater need for emergency care than today with the coronavirus. But also, I think what we learned in the process is so many times an emergency happens and you're not at home, you're not in contact with your clinic. So what do you do about that? How do you think about it? Or if you end up in an emergency department, what do they need to know and do? So you will see um, we have a lot of emergency care information. It includes the PJ Nicholas steroid protocol. I think this is one thing that we really have to be thinking about. When our children are in an emergency room or admitted to the hospital, if it's not one of the expert hospitals, a PJ Nikolov steroid protocol is very useful. Online resources for emergency care and for, for the flu and fracture management. I think that fractures are another really important um, problem because when they occur, what you need to think about and how those need to be treated, again, is really, really important. So we're going to talk about that. And now we have this expert panel. First of all, thank you to the panel for joining us today on a Saturday. I know with all of that's happening in this world, I can imagine that your schedules have, have extra burdens and extra time involved. So thank you so much for joining them. And I think we should begin with Han Fan from Children's of Alabama. Han, I'll turn this over to you. Thank you, Pat. So at first, I'd like to thank uh, PPMD for hosting this virtual webinar this morning and the families and the speakers to take out their time um, out of their weekend to join us today. I've been very, very fortunate in my career to have met and treated our kids and their families. I'm also very fortunate to have seen approved therapy or Duchenne in my lifetime. And that's primarily thanks to the continued support and the push from families, patient advocacy groups who have driven and pushed change in legislation, such as the MD Care Act in 2001, to enhance the research standard of care and creating centers of excellence. Uh, efforts from regulatory agencies and sponsors who have taken risk and invest to further innovate therapies for our boys. Um, when I was in training in Alabama, I um, will always remember uh, there was a child uh, who was 12 years old. Um, this was in early 2000. He came to our clinic, and he was in the clinical trial PTC for Adelurin. Um And at that time, we didn't have any clinical trial at our clinic for Duchenne. So he had to travel out of the state to participate in the trial. 
And everyone, when he came, gathered around uh, and to meet him as if he was a celebrity. Uh, at, at that time, um, we did not have but one or two study. Um, but at the current time, we now have more than two clinical uh, research uh, trials for our kids. And the involvement and the commitment and the dedications of the families to and our boys have been phenomenal. And we, uh, we see this on a weekly basis and if not on a daily basis. Um, Alpa, son, Krishna gets uh, his infusion every week and he never misses a week. Um, and if that means that they have to bring the entire family with them, including their service dog, Danica, to the clinic for Krishna's infusion. So we are very fortunate to be in this space and in this time uh, of continue strong, innovative therapy push. Um, so with that, I'm excited to see what the future will bring for our boys uh, with goal, our goal to end Duchenne. Um, I work as a clinician at the University of Alabama at the MDA clinic. In Atlanta, we have a clinical trial center that focuses on rare diseases. Um, and, and Eduardo um, will talk to you a little bit more about what we do and some of the available trials that we have at our center. Thank you so much. And I'll be around for any questions that um, anybody may have. Great. Thank you, Han. Eduardo, over to you. Yes. Uh, hi, uh, everyone, and good morning. And thank you to PCMG for this opportunity. I echo Dr. Fan's uh, word. Um, in my background, I am a scientist by training. I A couple of years ago, uh, while I was doing my research, I was uh, working as a biomedical and biological scientist. And I worked in clinical research during the last uh, three years. Uh, I worked um, in different uh, facets as a clinical research coordinator, as a startup project manager, and now as a clinical trial liaison, um, mostly uh, in the field of oncology and um, hematology. And now, uh, recently, I joined rare disease research uh, to work in the area of rare diseases, particularly uh, with DMD uh, patients. And we are really excited to be here talking about uh, RDR, rare disease research, and the different uh, clinical trials that we have for patients with DMD. And here in the slide, uh, you're able to see uh, some of the new trials that are about uh, to open at our center. Uh, one of the main purposes uh, of us being here talking to you is to raise awareness of uh, all the different opportunities uh, that you, your families uh, with DMD have uh, in terms of new uh, therapeutic options. And as you can see, we have uh, at the top of the list uh, the EPIDIS study. This study uh, um, uses uh, giving a set as the investigational product. Um, this uh, drug is basically looking uh, to protect muscles and to prevent and or reduce the damage that is caused uh, by uh, disease progression. And something very interesting about this one um, is that it is an oral uh, drug. Uh, patients will take two oral doses per day, uh, which in comparison to most of the other treatments uh, that are uh, intravenous infusions. Um, and this trial is going to be available uh, for ambulant uh, patients, patients that are still able to walk. Uh, we also have uh, some other trials uh, upcoming at our center. We have the Fibrogen study that uses Penreblumab, which is a humanized uh, monoclonal antibody. Um, and this trial is, this particular drug is uh, targeted to reduce uh, fibrosis, which was mentioned earlier uh, during our presentation, um, basically reducing scarring and fat accumulation uh, in uh, muscle tissue. We and, and that particular trial, the Hibernant trial, is available for the non-ambulatory population. So as you can see, we both uh, we have trials for both uh, ambulant and non-ambulant uh, patients. We also have our uh, uh, trials mission uh, and an investigative initiated study uh, that will be opening soon at our center that uses antisense oligonucleotides like uh, Exondis 51 and Biondis 53. Uh, in terms of the mission study. 
this one uh, will be opening for ambulant uh, patients. And our uh, investigator-initiated study using Biondis 53 will be open for non-ambulant patients. And since we, one of our, our main goals is to not only provide uh, current uh, therapies and well-known therapies, but the new, the latest uh, therapies for our DMD patients. Also, uh, in the near future, we are working on other types of uh, gene therapies, uh, for example, uh, including uh, CRISPR-based therapies. These are the most uh, novel and at the front board of uh, research uh, therapies, and we are really, really excited uh, to keep uh, bringing new studies, uh, learning from uh, the community, and also educating the community uh, about the different options that they have within clinical research. Um, so if you have any questions related to clinical trials, uh, you can uh, later ask me some of those questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And with that, I'm, we're going to move on to Laura. Okay. Um, Laura, uh, I've known Laura for many years, and she's a physical therapist from Duke University. Hi. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, Laura, okay. we can hear you. Okay, great. Thank you for including me in this um, wonderful um, day that everyone I know went to great efforts to make sure we could still all share information even though we couldn't travel to be with you in person. <clears throat> and I thank Parent Project and Pat for the unbelievable support they have given to this community over the years. It's it's just amazing. Um, so for me, um, you can go to my next slide. I have two areas that I'm going to give an overview of what um, roles PT has, physical therapy have in the um, in Duchenne. And these apply both to the clinical world and the, um, well, the set assessment applies to both the clinical world and the world of research, whereas in a minute I will talk about assessment, <clears throat> I mean intervention, and that is more in the clinical world and as follow-up to some of the disease-modifying interventions. So um, in terms of um, physical therapy's role in Duchenne, um, we have um, for many years um, tried to help in terms of minimizing the clinical impact um, of Duchenne and in helping um, in achieving a highest pro uh, possible quality of life for individuals with Duchenne. It is a very um, different time now. It's, it's so much more optimistic with disease-modifying um, interventions coming along. In terms of assessment, um, I've put several links on this slide. Um, I wanted to just mention the overarching reasons we do assessment, and then you can look at all the details about different assessments that are in these articles, the care considerations and the rehabilitation article and the pediatric supplement. So overall, why do we need to do assessment? It's important to assess someone's present status and how they may be changing over time, which um, now and in the future is actually hopefully going to include change over time that uh, includes improvements, which is very exciting, of course. Um, to, it's also important to, do, to um, assess to allow optimal individualized intervention. So when, um, when someone with Duchenne is assessed um, uh, individually, it's to look at what, how they're doing, what they might need, and many, many, many details of what they might need. <clears throat> In uh, PT, when we do assessments, we do it across what they call the ICS, which means that, which is described in these articles, uh, which is the International Classification of Function. So that means that some of the measurements we will be doing are very specific, like looking at range of motion or how flexible somebody is. <clears throat> and then other assessments, maybe overall function, which some of you may have are very familiar with these tests. So some of the timed functional tests, the six-minute walk tests, those are tests um, of overall function. Um, and then other tests and assessments have to do with quality of life and how well somebody can participate and uh, across a whole range of um, categories that are important to assess in order to help um, optimize someone's life. <clears throat> And then it's important to assess to see the effects of intervention. So if someone has a problem with um, uh, muscle extensibility and you do an assessment, um, it's important to follow up um, with an assessment later on to see if what you're doing is helping enough or whether you need to change gears and do something else that would help more. So over time, it's important to assess someone repeatedly to make sure that things are going in the right direction. Um, and then, of course, one of the most exciting areas in assessment is to assess and optimize improvement with some of the disease-modifying treatments that are coming out 
that will be increasing over time. And um, so this is one of the areas that also um, is important in research, as Pat mentioned, the outcomes that are used, the outcome measures that are used in the research studies, these are very important in terms of seeing um, how much and in what ways the disease-modifying treatments are um, successful and are helping. So overall assessment, as I said, is to look at um, the present status, how that may be changing over time, to allow us to provide good treatment, um, and to allow us to see um, the effects of the disease-modifying assessments. <clears throat> Another thing that's important about assessment is that it is increasingly done from a, a younger and younger age, which will be linked to some of the newborn screening. It's going to be important to assess younger and younger children in all of these different ways. And um, for our adults uh, with Duchenne and Becker, it's very important for us as they are um, functioning in their adult lives. It's important for us to know what's important to assess so that we can know what's important to help. Okay, if you go to the next slide. <clears throat> okay, so this is my second and final slide, um, is about the category of intervention. So how do physical therapists, um, what is their role in terms of intervention? And this is important in terms of providing comprehensive, anticipatory, preventative management across the lifespan. And what we mean when we say that is Duchenne is understood well enough that we should have the best working knowledge of all of the details as physical therapists so that we can be ahead of the game. We can be intervening in a way that is preventative, that is addressing something before it becomes a big problem, and that is um, often helps us help more. <clears throat> so the different categories in which a physical therapist can help with intervention is in direct treatment by PTs, OTs, and speech pathologists, and a, a myriad of other folks who are on the multidisciplinary team. Um, to actually help in terms of um, direct treatment. Um, and I can answer questions about any of these things later. Um, in terms of musculoskeletal management, that basically addresses the issue of keeping someone in good shape. Um, and that involves things like stretching and um, orthotic intervention, different kinds of splints and AFOs and serial casting and lots of different things that can be options. Supported standing, which can be helpful in keeping someone stretched out and helping with their bone health and all kinds of other um, benefits. And then also looking at custom seating and power positioning components for folks who are using wheelchairs. There are all kinds of sophisticated mechanisms where it um, allows someone to help take care of their body um, more independently um, as they're using their wheelchair. <clears throat> Exercise and activity is another area that's important to address um, by physical therapists. And as we know, it's important with uh, fragile muscles to be careful to protect them. We want to protect the muscles while we're also helping them to be as healthy as possible. And so, <clears throat> um, I'm is a typo that, that uh, uh, should be gentle exercise, submaximal, and that should say avoid excessive um, resistance and eccentric muscle activity, which are all documented in those um, care considerations if you want to listen more detail. So there are several reasons that it's important to be gentle with exercise and activity levels. One is um, relates to what everyone else has talked about in terms of the muscles being somewhat fragile um, because they don't have the dystrophin there to act as a shock absorber and protect the muscles. That's one thing. <clears throat> and the other thing that no one has talked about yet is the issue about something called NOS, which has to do with um, the, uh, the support of uh, exercise levels and activity levels in terms of um, blood supply and things like that to the muscles when you're exercising. So those are two important areas that um, are uh, make it important to be careful with exercise and with activity levels. Another area, as Pat mentioned, which is falls and pre uh, fracture prevention and management. The PT has a role in that to work with um, the team and orthopedics about that. Um, another area <clears throat> which um, is probably handled more by occupational therapy on the rehab team is management and some of the learning, attentional, and sensory processing differences, which um, it's important for the children and the adults to get support with this to help them um, excel um, in their uh, learning, attention, and their um, with some of the considerations with sensory processing. Another area for intervention is assistive technology and adaptive equipment um, for two different reasons, for musculoskeletal management, as I mentioned, and also for function, for independence, and participation. So we don't want the um, physical issues that may be 
making it more difficult for uh, individuals to participate. We want to remove those obstacles by providing the appropriate um, assistive technology and adaptive equipment to let people thrive. We want to make sure we're addressing pain that may be present in terms of prevention and management. We want to optimize participation, so again, so individuals can thrive through their entire lives, in their childhood, their elementary school years, high school, and, and adulthood. Um, and we want to help with the transition into and through adulthood to let people really thrive throughout their lives. So that's a brief overview of the topics and the areas in which physical therapy can uh, and rehab management can be helpful. And then I'm happy to take any questions later. Thank you, Laura. That was really wonderful and a wonderful overview. We so appreciate it. And I think I, I love the word thrive. Uh, and I think that um, sometimes we we don't as associate that word with Duchenne. And I think that um, there are many ways and, and many reasons to expect that our young men will thrive throughout this disease. And the next speaker is Danielle Gray from uh, Sinsa Children's. Danielle, um, as we all know, the behaviors in Duchenne, some of the cognitive issues that are, are, are sometimes present or present in some boys, as well as the anxiety and depression that can occur throughout the lifespan, are so important and, and so um, important for us to have addressed very well. So Danielle is going to speak to that. All right. Hi, everyone. I first want to express gratitude for um, the opportunity to join with you today. Um, my hope is to give an overview of psychosocial care models and common concerns um, that might present. And I'll just highlight um, some of the information on the slides that you'll see um, so that way we can allow some um, time for discussion and questions. Um, I came into my role in the Neuromuscular Center in order to help follow the psychosocial care guidelines um, and our medical team's desire to, to meet the needs of the boys and young men um, in their clinic. Um, and those guidelines suggest routine screening of um, mental health and quality of life. So there's an opportunity for intervention or potential referral for neuropsychological evaluations when that is needed. Um, how these guidelines are followed in terms of what the psychologist's role is and when they become involved is more open and can depend across centers. At our center at um, Cincinnati Children's, um, psychology is part of the interdisciplinary clinic visits, um, the goal being to provide universal screening. So everyone is seen between one and one and a half years to assess functioning across medical and psychosocial domains um, in a prevention-based approach, as uh, Laura mentioned earlier in her talk. That gives us the opportunity for targeted intervention so we can catch and address um, emotional, behavioral, social, or like adherence-related concerns. These are more so symptoms, not necessarily what we would consider to be a disorder, but they're generally common symptoms, but they're risk factors for ongoing problems over time. Our hope being that we can give skills and tools that might help. Um, and so some patients might be seen at their six-month clinic visit just to check in and make sure those targeted interventions are meeting their needs. Um, but otherwise, if there's um, more limited concerns, then we might see each other uh, yearly. And then lastly, there's that tier in terms of level of care that's more clinical and treatment level. Um, so this is lit for those patients that have more persistent concerns or at an intensity that suggests more regular support like local counseling, whether this be with or without medication, would be helpful. Um, and then next slide, please. The reason why we take this approach is that we know that individuals with DMD are at risk for a variety of concerns. Um, as healthcare providers, we hope to meet those potential needs, but I think it's really important to highlight um, that this does not necessarily mean all with Duchenne or Becker will have these problems, um, and we know many young men are doing quite well, um, but it's important to be aware and consider those potential uh, symptoms that can present so we can be most helpful um, for the needs that do come up. Um, the main theme, I think, in terms of main concerns that might present are around regulation of attention, arousal, and motivation, and that can impact a number of different areas of functioning. As children get older in general, school and life demands naturally pull for the ability to manage larger tasks and doing so more independently. And that can tax um, attentional skills um, that might be difficult for individuals, um, such as multi-step tasks, um, working memory, that running to-do list in our heads, so keeping track of where we are in the task and what we need to do next. Common learning concerns tend to be more in the reading fluency or reading comprehension domain. Um, other challenges might be 
They might be managing daily activities well, but then it's coping when um, there are activities that come up that are out of routine or out of um, typical expectations. And so these challenges alone or in combination can uh, sometimes explain some of the task avoidance or noncompliant behaviors that we sometimes may see. In the language domain, we might see slower responding or just really needing more time for verbal expression or answering questions. So that might mean taking in too much verbal, um, listening to someone, particularly if they're already emotionally upset, can be overwhelming, and further tax that generally hyperaroused state that they uh, potentially might be in. And then the third most common domain that we might see in terms of concerns would be managing um, anxiety or mood-related concerns. So the next slide, please. There are a number of different um, supports that can be provided um, within um, our clinic setting. Um, and I have the figure there just to really highlight within our team um, the number of people that are involved and centered around our patients and families that we see um, in goals of, of helping to maximize their, their functioning. I'm just going to highlight on a few of the different um, strategies or supports that we might be um, providing. Um, so with managing emotions or recognizing those things, sometimes simply ensuring they have planned activity breaks. Um, this even includes preferred activities like video games. Um, one activity, regardless of um, like or dislike, over time can um, add to an already hyperaroused state. Um, so breaks allow for that opportunity for self-regulation that can sometimes be difficult, and then they can return um, to that task again. Um, sometimes just having um, what are those environmental supports or behavioral tools to help with um, regulating attention or managing tasks that might be difficult, so they can thrive um, in the home and school setting. Um, we apply evidence-based treatments um, like cognitive behavioral therapy for anxiety or mood-related symptoms. Um, these symptoms may or may not be um, specific to coping with their disease. Um, in terms of medical regimen, there's a lot that is asked of caregivers and young men with DMD um, that is done to best slow down the disease progression and maximize their quality of life, but we know that can be challenging um, combined with just daily um, stressors and coordinating family routines. My goal is to meet the patients and families where they are and collaborate together on problem solving or other strategies to help them consistently meet those medical management goals. Um, in terms of coping with disease, um, that can vary over the course of the lifespan. Um, this could include um, discussions of whether, when, or how. Um, they might disclose to their friends what their diagnosis is. Um, coping with declines in motor function or associated logistics. So how are they coordinating getting together with friends whenever they're um, coordinating their needs with their care? Um, and then as they get older, naturally, um, it's important to have a sense of independence and how can we focus on promoting this within the context of their increased needs for physical support? Um, and then sometimes we might conduct values-based assessments. And so really what this focuses on are what are those things or the, the themes of things that are important to them that they derive meaning. So, for example, if someone in, um, is a very creative person or they enjoy being service to others, in what way or how can we help them to pursue those values in a way that they have control over um, and support their quality of living? I think the themes that we've had across the talks is more of how do we help individuals to thrive um, and to feel like they're doing well in their daily life. Thank you. Thank you so very much. That was so that was very helpful and a wonderful overview. We so appreciate it. Next, we have Karen Lautner from uh, Children's Hospital of Atlanta. I think bone health is so critical for our boys. They're generally on steroids uh, for the most part throughout their, throughout their whole journey with Duchenne, which causes a negative impact to the bone. So, Karen, um, we're really looking forward to hearing you talk about bone health in Duchenne. Hi. So, um, I'm at... Emory slash Choa. I mean, clinically, it's all become the Children's Hospital of Atlanta, um, and I have an appointment at Emory as well. I should have put endocrine there also because we do both. I do one-stop shopping in terms of you hopefully you don't need two different doctors when you're coming in terms of um, – if you go to the next slide, we can go through an overview, please, of just different topics we're going to cover. So bone health is, in the 2018 guidelines, really took a big – um, stage in terms of finally recognizing that, you know, when your child is gone and broken a leg or, or an arm, the key addition to 2018 was that the compression fracture. So anyone who's seen me in clinic, we've talked about 
And now that I'm in my 50s, I have to watch this camera. When you get older and you get compression fractures and say you're shrinking or hunching over or whatever, this can happen in our children who are on steroids, whether it's for Duchenne's or rheumatoid arthritis or any kind of condition. About one in three children on steroids or adults um, for more than two years will develop a compression fracture. So the reason for knowing this is to be aware that we need to screen for it. So it's not a surprise test or it's overwhelming, like, why is there something else going on when this is actually part of the side effects of something that's very critical for the kids, which is the steroids. Um, the good news is that because of the recognition of the 2018 statement, it's more widely being screened. I mean, I've been doing it for the past decade or so, but the idea is that now it's it's being done by almost everyone and recognized as an, a time for intervention. So when I see kids in clinic, we get the DEXA scan. Um, that tells us just bone density. And often, almost universally, if you're on steroids, they'll be low. Uh, it also can be low because of vitamin D deficiency, and that's probably due to steroids, but I would say in the current era of screen time, and not going outside to play until, like, the lights are out kind of thing, until it's nighttime like we used to do 100 years ago when I was a kid. Um, kids do have vitamin D deficiency. And I would say about half my kids, at least in endocrine and bone clinic, so across the board endocrine clinic, regardless of bone disease, will have vitamin D deficiency. And so the mainstay is to get the vitamin D normal. We talk about dietary calcium, as I'm sure everyone knows who see me in clinic getting at least three to four, uh, if not five servings in a day, which is the AA American Academy of Pediatrics recommendation for calcium, depending on age, between three and five. Um, and so that's the main stage. That's the bone-building part. The drugs that we use for this phosphonate are, in terms of the game of Pac-Man, it became incredibly useful as a uh like a, a visual cue in terms of explaining to children, you know, this is a drug that blocks Pac-Man. These are the cells that chew up bone. And so the dysphosphonates the like semitronate, zelenronate, we do both of those um, at CHOA when indicated. Um, and they really help the bone chewing up part. So it's very important to do both parts of bone building and bone chewing. So bone building would be the calcium and the vitamin D. The other piece of bone building is testosterone. I'll get back to that with the endocrine part. But just basically thinking about all the ingredients that help bone to be stronger. We want to maximize those first. The second piece is then if we have a fracture that's considered, when we say pathological, it's such a horrible word, but it means that it's a fracture that is unexpected. So you know if you fell off a trampoline, you anyone could break, or you saw off the monkey bars, a younger kid, everyone can break. These are pathological means that the the injury didn't match what, what you know, the scenario was. So your child tripped off one stair but broke a leg. That would be pathological. A compression fracture is just gravity. And so that's gravity over a long time period can cause the spine to decrease in uh, change size or shape. And that's considered pathological because we all have to live in gravity. Um, and nothing, it wasn't from, I try to explain to parents, it's not that your child fell or you didn't do anything wrong or it wasn't, you know, things can make it worse, but it's, it's basically gravity. So together we look at how to make bones stronger. We screen with DEXA scans and spine films, usually every six months, depending on the scenario and if a child's on steroids or not, will obviously play a huge role in this. The other piece, and I, I was teased that I should make up um, T-shirts, nerdy, but that would fit me, would be, you know, the Bones No Stones Clinic in terms of we want to make sure that whatever we do for the bones, we're not putting the child at risk for kidney stones. And so especially kids who have who are not ambulatory um there's just a higher risk of, of for anyone who's not ambulatory to have kidney stones. And so we do follow the urine calcium. If it's elevated, we do check renal ultrasound. I have a close relationship with nephrology. 
um, and uh, the DMD clinic. And it's, you know, it's a risk assessment. So we want to make sure that we're doing everything possible with changes in diet, changes in hydration, and not just putting on more drugs. Um, but there needs to there. So we work, it's um, the bone clinic with the Duchenne clinic with the nephrology has put together what we call the bone health protocol. And that started in around 2016, 2017 when I arrived at CHOA. So I was just hired by CHOA to start a bone clinic because there wasn't one here. I've been here almost exactly April Fool's Day, ironically, is my start date. And that will be four years I've been here. Um, we now have over, um, I think about over half the kids and they have 150 boys to be seen. Uh, I have about a dozen children who are now getting the phosphate infusion. So it's, as we need them, they get seen, they get screened by the clinic. They um, have to get patients outside of CHOA through Dr. Pond. So it's anyone that needs me, I'm there for. Um, is there any question on the bone health or should I just go right into the endocrine? Why don't you go right into endocrine and then we're going to open it up for questions. Okay. So in terms of the endocrine, and obviously they play, they're, they're tightly linked in terms of part of the uh, 2018 uh, guidelines in Lancet was to recognize we don't want to, puberty we know is delayed, but we don't want to wait forever. So typically by definition, puberty, a delayed puberty in the general population would be considered 16. The concern was by waiting until 16, testosterone being such an important uh, bone health factor would be a missed ingredient that we could introduce earlier. So the guidelines are now to, if the puberty is later than 14, to evaluate that. And we do screen for puberty levels, and if you're on steroids, it's thought to um, delay puberty, both at the level of the pituitary or the brain, as well as at the testicle for direct production of testosterone. And we have started uh, testosterone treatments um, in several boys, uh, ambulatory or non-ambulatory. Um, and I have to say, just the smile on a boy's face when he comes in because he's got a deeper voice and a mustache, it's, it's pretty priceless. <laughs> it's, they're, you know, they feel more like their friends, and um, it's got multiple levels of I'm happy when the DEXA scan gets better, but I'm also um, probably even happier when I see the smile on the kid's face because he feels just like his friend. So it has multiple factors. Um, the next one I want to touch on, because this is for everyone should know this and make sure this is part of their care, is the adrenal insufficiency. And this is highlighted in the guidelines. Um, all my kids get, uh, or we're trying to make sure that all the kids get uh, medic alert um, letters so they have to carry with them. It's amazing how many kids have gone into emergency rooms for a fracture or injury or the flu, hopefully not corona, um, that aren't, are denied stress test steroids. I have parents texting me on the phone, they won't give me it. Um, all my patients pretty much have my phone number as um, they can attest to. But the idea is that they shouldn't have to call me, they should know this. So bringing this medical letter, getting a medic alert tag, we can help you with, you know, what to put on it, like adrenal insufficiency risk, chronic steroid use, et cetera, things to raise awareness. Um, and then in clinic, we just started implementing this past year, which has been huge, is I have a nurse dedicated um, to anyone that comes into clinic will do teaching. So you're not relying on just, a, you know, YouTube will help you, but I would think it would be hard for many people to give a shot based on just a YouTube video. I would find it a little challenging to, to use the needle on the kit, et cetera. Obviously, it's an emergency. You're going to do what you have to do. But we're trying to do teaching. I'm trying to expand teaching into the kids who are getting infusions, um, as well as just to the Duchenne Clinic in general, because I haven't seen yet, because they haven't met criteria for me to see through the bone health protocol, but they all need to know about adrenal insufficiency. So, I'm meeting with them actually in a few weeks and trying to get um, so that my nurse gets permission to go to their clinic to do the teaching. Um, emergency hydrocortisone does not mean if you're, and we could always do this, but if your child threw up once, it doesn't mean you have to run and give them a shot. If your child's in, in the clinic, you always should have a doctor, you should have a call um, or a service. 
you know, if an hour later, like with any child on steroids, you can give the diplodic or prednisone, that's fine. So there's always should be someone you should be able to feel this off of when you need it, but have access to it, have the kit. They all need prior authorization, and we do that for the patients also. Every insurance will say no first. This is typical for many things. And that's part of, we do it as part of our job to help navigate is to get that medication covered for you. Um, growth is a very broad topic in terms of depending where you are, testosterone can be important for growth. Um, I think the big question is obviously whenever you start steroids, the growth, you know, becomes markedly decreased, the growth velocity. And as kids get started early and earlier, it may have a very profound effect on the Duchenne's, which you can't deny. I mean, that's, that'll be, you know, you have to do what you have to do. I view my job as endocrine and bone as I'm sort of the backdoor pickup person in terms of you need this therapy. What can I do to help make it, you know, help take care of the side effects maybe due to the therapy or help, you know, get around things so you can stay on the best therapy you can for the Duchenne's. Um, in the 2018 statement, um, growth hormone was raised, but really it's um, still in a research kind of stage, if that makes sense. And so I think with – I was very interested in, in something I think these meetings are very good for in terms of when we talk about, you know, the PATH and people who follow that, like the PATH trajectories for children, that all could be part of a very formalized growth hormone study in terms of who – how do we assess for physical therapy? How do we assess for the really theoretical downside of growth hormone and see who are the good candidates for it um, and monitor for that? So that's still a question mark where some some providers are doing growth hormone, but very in very select patients. Um, but I think it's, it's a huge uh, research avenue in terms of studying it very methodically and then taking the mystical part of it out and addressing it. And so I'm hoping that will become part of a research venue um, in the near future. Was that too fast? No, Karen, thank you so much. I think the looming question for you would be, and we're opening the, the phone lines um, now so that people can ask their questions, but I think one of the questions that is always is on our mind um, in, in, right now is about the coronavirus. Should patients and families have steroids at home, an injectable? Should you know what are the reinforcements, for instance, that they should have given these circumstances? I think any child, just like if they had the flu, um, every child uh, we're trying. That's part of the standard. We're trying to make that is considered now part of the standard of care. And I'm trying to branch out to people having met yet, but to have my nurse go and teach every single child in the clinic, uh, the parent had to do like the active vial or slide cortex, whichever kit is available for their insurance. So that parents do have the medic alert um, in some states, not and in some places in Georgia, Georgia wasn't as easy to do in terms of um, getting EMS involved. But in a lot of places you can actually um, register with EMS and so that if you ever need to call 911, your address pulls up and it lists adrenal insufficiency on the on your address. And so they know to bring the kit. So that's something you could always look into also in your region to get registered with EMS. And you could also list the school address so that if you get called to that school, the name will flag as a child who's potentially adrenal insufficient. Because not all ambulances even carry the kit. So you could delay the process of saying, well, I can't do a shot. I'm going to call 911. 911 doesn't bring the kit. And then you're waiting for two hours in the emergency room. So you really can delay things. So yeah. having the kit is huge because then if you, if the, if the paramedic shows up without it, but the prescription, they can usually give it. So okay. yes, we, That's if you ask the provider, um, it has to be a prior authorization. So don't be dismayed if you get a prescription and you go to the pharmacy and say it's not covered. It won't be. Insurance says no first, but make sure the provider know. You know, you know we know, but make sure the provider knows if it's not someone that's in a, a setting like this that they have to submit a prior authorization for it to get approved, so you can get a kit. And sometimes we're able to get a kit like one for school, one for home, that kind of thing. 
Yes, I had that very helpful. So having a letter will facilitate at least like a medical letter saying my child needs this on the hospital and we put the dose in and how to give it, that kind of thing, and a contact information for everybody. Okay, great. And would they, they would go to their neuromuscular um, physician, is that right, for this letter? I give it directly to the parents, but then I share it with, I, sh- I try to believe in team approach, and so I, I'll share it with anyone I can on the ethics system, so to speak. So anyone who looks at care everywhere should be able to see it also. Um, but I, I give the letters to the families. Okay, thank you. And Han, can you speak to how you manage this in your in within your clinic? Uh, yes. So um, we Karen has been a great resource for a lot of our patients. Um, before she came to Chowa, um, I think all of these patients were being dispersed and scrambled around to get a good endocrinologist who understands Tushan's patients. Um, so in in Alabama, what we've done. Um, we have a an endocrinologist who specializes in bone health and Duchenne's patient as well. Um, so we typically follow the guidelines and the recommendations of the endocrinologist. So when we have our weekly uh, team meetings, what we typically go through um, in regard to bone health and endocrine issues is that the first thing is, is this patient on steroids and what sort of surveillance that this patient is um, currently under, meaning excess skin, um, spine film, and such. Um, and then third thing, most important thing um, as well, is to have uh, the patient understand um, in the case of emergency situations. And, you know, we say emergencies, but even in mild illnesses or minor surgeries, those are still considered minor emergencies that um, we typically have a discussion and counsel patients on how to approach this and who to notify and who to call. And having the um, injectable kit on hand is, is invaluable, particularly when you do truly have an emergency and your child can't swallow or, or take anything by mouth. Um, but in most of those instances, patients should be, should be in that in the hospital rather than trying to manage it at home. But, um, you know, I, I think that steroids, uh, uh, stress dose is, is important in, in all of our patients. Great. Thank you. And and I'm, I'm going to throw this next question to Han and Eduardo and, and, and Laura as well. You know, in the clinical trial process and now with the threat of the coronavirus and all of us trying to stay um, socially distanced and distanced from any risk whatsoever, in addition to the fact that our young men are, are compromised, um, immune compromised with the use of steroids, do you worry that or how do you see clinical trials, how do you see the regular um, clinical site visits, the outcome measures, are, are you worried, how are you managing that, do you think that we'll lose some data, um, what is, what is, how are you managing and I'll start with Han, and then I'll go down to Eduardo and Laura. Uh, sure. So we um, we actually had a fairly late day yesterday um, talking to Sarepta and some of our other sponsors on how to manage uh, some of the travel that patient has to uh, perform. We um, at our center we don't just have local patients; we do have patients from other states to travel um, to our sites to participate in clinical trials. Um, So the next patient who will be at our site would be next Friday, and he's coming from Connecticut. Um, So we're trying to figure out how can we avoid um, situations where um, we are putting patients at risk, especially infectious risk, um, in our kids with pulmonary um, compromised and also immunocompromised. Um, so we have been able to, and, and this is a work in progress, um, enlist the help of um, local home health nurse and agency to do infusions, to collect labs. We also have um, our satellite centers in New York that patients potentially, particularly for this one, could travel to. Um, so it would be a, a 
a driving um, trip rather than a flying trip. Um, we also have changed our clinic schedule in that we are trying to, our best to avoid to have multiple patients in the clinic at once. So, for example, on Thursday, we have two patients coming to our clinic. We schedule one for the morning and one for the afternoon. And after each patient, we thoroughly um, practice sanitation with wiping down all of the contact services and doorknobs and such. Um, so I think we have to be hyper vigilant, and of course, our patients are safety first. Um, and we we do understand, and sponsors do understand that in this setting, in in the setting of coronavirus um, scares, we are and will lose some data points. Um, and that's just how we we will um, have to accept that. And unfortunately, um, this will come, our patient safety will, will be the foremost um, priority for us. Thank you. Eduardo? Yes, um, I don't have much to add since we work in the, in the same center. Um, but I agree with Dr. Fan first. The most important thing will be the safety and uh, the health of our patients. Uh, however, uh, speaking not just from our center's perspective, but clinical research in general, such a situation is definitely uh, can definitely impact in a negative way uh, the outcomes uh, for clinical research, mainly because the data might be compromised. Uh, obviously, this if this gets, keeps getting worse, we might have a lot of uh, protocol deviations. Um, uh, however, uh, just like our center is able to use home health, home health services and our satellite locations, other centers might have to, uh, if possible at all, uh, use uh, similar alternatives trying to maintain uh, compliance with clinical protocols, but at the same time uh, being very vigilant and, and uh, have all the uh, be very careful that we're protecting uh, our immunocompromised uh, children. Thank you. And Laura? Yes, yeah, sorry, I just unmuted myself. Um, yes, I think pa uh, patient safety is the um, ultimate, and I think it is uh, changing. It's changing sort of almost minute by minute. So I haven't been back on the Duke uh, website. Um, in the last two hours, but there is a place you can go to um, on the Duke website. I'm sure all the other hospitals and research centers have that also, where there are uh, updates on what's being done and how things are being handled and things like um, visitor policies and um, just so many things that are changing, um, really it's a very rapidly changing scene to make sure that patient safety is the thing that's um, protected most ultimately. Great, thank you. And uh, we have several questions that have come in, so I'm just going to read them. And uh, in, in Choa, under consideration to become a, it's Choa considering um, some applying for a PPMD certified Duchenne care center. Actually, I don't know who the answer to that is. Is if I wrote it down on my to do list, I'm meeting with um, Dr. Verma in like two weeks, and that's one of my questions I already wrote down on my list as I was reviewing these wonderful slides. Um, to to be an access to make sure everything's up to date, et cetera. And um, I think that would be and the different things I was hearing about. It would be wonderful to make sure that everything's employed and um, include us into, you know, more integrate the kids more into other studies. So there's not so much of a sense of shopping around, which is always the case in any kind of, any kind of condition. Yeah, that, that would be terrific. Um, and we have one for the Rare Disease Center. How should we go about connecting with this to the center? Can we go to you directly and make an appointment, or do we have to go through another doctor? Uh, so you, um, if you go on our website, there is our contact information. Um, we, we do get um, patients who will independently contact us to participate in trials, either by our web page or um, emails or just simply calling us. Um, we do encourage that you continue to maintain your relationship with your primary 
uh, neurologists or neuromuscular teams um, because we we can put, help you to participate in clinical trials, but we still want you to maintain your relationship with your treating physicians. And we do have close communications with um, your treating physician. Um, Dr. Lofto and I, we, we are just a phone call away and we um, oftentimes text each other with patients' um, issues and matters. So we, we do stay in touch and I try to stay in touch with all of the treating physicians just to keep them abreast and, and with the current clinical trials that you're participating in. Great, thank you. And in, in the discussion of clinical trials, what are, what's the protocol and ethics and how, you know, if you qualify for a trial, is there some sort of a waiting list or how, how do you go about selecting and identifying patients for a given trial? Maybe Eduardo, uh, so do you we, want to start with that? Or, or Han, that's fine. Uh, Eduardo, I... Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I can speak to that. Yeah. Uh, well, inclusion, uh, exclusion and uh, um, enrollment varies depending on, on the trial. So some trials will be open enrollment. However, other trials have uh, a specific amount of slots that are um, allowed for uh, research center. Uh, for example, we might have one study where we only are allowed to initially enroll two subjects, and therefore every other subject after those two subjects will be on a waiting list. Um, in terms of um, uh, we, uh, how do we get patients uh, referred to us, uh, for example, with the DMZ community, a lot of the families know each other. So most of the patients that for, for DMZ studies that we have in our center is because uh, patients' families talk uh, to each other. and. Um, another way that we get a lot of patients uh, for DMV and for other indications that we work in, uh, we work a lot with uh, patient uh, support groups and also with patient advocacy groups, uh, for example, PPMD, and um, in other uh, indications we have worked with uh, closely with uh, patient support groups, and that way we are able uh, to connect with the people uh, that need uh, information about the trials, and then we can get an appointment and meet with the families and the patients and make sure that they qualify for a specific trial. And if uh, they do not qualify at that instance for that particular trial or for any of the other trials that we have available at our site, we might be able to direct them uh, to somewhere else where they will be able to receive um, access to clinical trials. Um, and that's basically a part of our mission and vision statement. Uh, we just want to provide access to uh, investigational uh, treatments to all of our rare disease patients and also um, cultivate relationships with the sponsors that are providing this uh, trial and uh, making this, uh, and then we do our part on making this uh, uh, therapeutic options accessible to all of our patients. Thank you, Eduardo. So nice to hear. Uh, I think it's reassuring to patients that if there isn't a particular slot in a given trial in your institution that you will refer out and see if you can get them slotted into somewhere else that might have a, a, a clinical study that, that could potentially be useful for their, for their um, son. I, thank you for that. That's really comforting, I'm sure, to all of the families. Dr. Lochner, in regard to the growth hormone studies, what about if a child is um, before they start taking steroids if their growth, hor their growth hormone deficient? How do you manage that? I think if a child, I think it's like again, unfortunately, it's still a a very mystical concern. It doesn't mean mystical, meaning not valid, meaning this concern about our our muscles more or less strong with growth hormone. You could actually postulate both could be the case with your Um There's sort of a, a dogma that you know shorter is better in terms of the muscle strength, but there's really not data supporting that. Um, the growth hormone deficiency testing, you know, we do that, I do that, you know, weekly, if not more, for uh, kids in endocrine who want to be taller, um, are dubious also in terms of when they call someone deficient, it's an arbitrary number of less than 10, for instance, when you get a stimulation agent. And so to be truly growth hormone deficient, clinically, we look at it a little bit differently versus will this pass the insurance muster? You know, will insurance pay for it versus 
is a child truly deficient? And that's a level of conversation that should happen as well, as opposed to thinking, my child's missing this hormone, how can you not give it back? Is a different story than your child will get paid by insurance, but, you know, Europe wouldn't pay for this because it's not considered deficient. So there's a lot of a little quirky things about that. I think what I would love to see is, and after talking with other physicians who do have children on growth hormone, we've been able to push for, you know, instead of once a year, twice a year, and I would love PT's input also, evaluations more fastidiously, given these um, not validated, but valid, if that makes sense, concerns about effective growth hormone and muscle and um, one negotiation about one child was to have them be seen more often to get the physical, the phys- physiatry type parameters to make sure we are doing no harm. Because that's the essence for all of this is improve height is one piece, but not decrease ambulation or motor health or other pe- or scoliosis or contractures or other things that may be affected by growth hormone. And I think that to be done hand in hand. And that's where I see on a case-by-case basis important, but also I think a bigger picture would be the the path trajectory um, would play a big role in this in the overall scheme. But on a case-by-case right now would be to have that um, closer look at physical therapy parameters to make sure that, again, as the child may be growing, and we have no doubt that they probably will grow even with their steroids, but that would do no harm along the way. Great, thank you, Laura. Would you like? Could you comment on this as yes, well? Yeah, I was gonna. I was gonna pitch in on that. Um, uh, you can hear me, right? Yes. yes. Good. Um, mm-hmm. Yes, I think that's why some of the assessments um, are very important. The PT assessments repeatedly over time, and to really be vigilant, um, because I think that some of the things that are going to be changing in the future are it, one is going to be the capacity of the muscles for activity and exercise and strengthening, and two, in terms of what um, was just being discussed, is it is a change changes in body configuration can affect things. So I think that. The importance of having specific assessments from PT to help with the rest of the team is important, not only the outcome measures, which are functional outcome measures that probably get a lot, a little bit more attention these days because they're so important in all the studies, but the regular old physical therapy measures about posture, alignment, muscle extensibility, all those sorts of things will be able to help inform um, the other decisions the rest of the team is making in terms of what impact does that have on the musculoskeletal system. Great. Thank you, Laura. And Laura, just while, uh, while I have you, um, I know this is a, probably a, I'm not setting you up for the question, but are there some general guides you tell, or you talk to parents about how much exercise is too much exercise? Um, because I think it's a question that we don't really have definitive answers for, but as, as a parent, you always wonder, how much should I allow my child to do if he's interested in soccer or interested in baseball? Should I promote yes. that idea or should I diminish it? Yes, I think it's a really important question. It's probably the hard, one of the hardest questions because it is not known. The exact right amount is not known of what, what's, what's helpful versus what is potentially harmful. And so I actually think it's really important to uh, individualize that. Well, to know the guidelines, so to know the general the general um, knowledge, which is that the muscles still are fragile. Now, someday I'm looking forward to the day when there will be enough disease-modifying um, treatments that the muscles will no longer have such fragility. But right now, they still do. And so we have to protect them from that standpoint. There are certain things that will tell you if a child has done too much. And, and so I think to have an open dialogue and to trust the child and to trust the parent's perception of the child in terms of do they seem too wiped out, sort of too tired after they've done a certain activity? Well, that's your clue to maybe back off a little bit next time um, and to respect the child's report to you. I think I think people with Duchenne and, and little kids with Duchenne, they're very smart about what their muscles are telling them. So you can sometimes hear people you know, using the word, oh, lazy or doesn't want to do things, which I don't believe in that at all. I think that when a, when a child with Duchenne is active and then he sits down to rest, that's because his muscles are telling him he needs to sit down and rest. So these are the kind of individual clues I think it's very important for us to respect and pay attention to. 
Um, and, and if you, and if, there's research out there that has watched young kids with Duchenne, and that is how they move. They'll move a little bit, and then they'll sit and rest, and then they'll move a little bit more, and then they'll sit and rest. And so I think they have great sense about what's right. The time I think it's tricky is when they're trying to keep up with their peers, and they may push themselves too hard. And so that's when probably the adults in the room have to step in and maybe everybody gets a rest, you know, in the, in the classroom they, or whatever, whatever the situation is, so that the child doesn't get signaled at, uh, singled out as much as, oh, he needs to rest. Maybe all of us need to rest right now, things like that. Um, and then to look at some of the things that people know, so eccentric exercise, which is when you use your muscles kind of backwards to either to do squats or lower yourself down or to go to go downstairs, and um, those are things that are hard on muscles. If you, if anyone listening doesn't have a good sense of what an eccentric muscle contraction is, your PT should be able to help you in knowing that and to look at different activities and say, oh, yeah, that is sort of involving too much eccentric activity or that is involving too much resistance um, and to avoid those activities. Um, and then, of course, the bigger things, if you ever have dark urine, then, of course, that is a sign that there's been too much. The old general rule of thumb that people used to always talk about, whereas if the child is exhausted one day after a certain level of activity the day before, generally that's a clue. I know it sounds so vague, but... I actually respect the parents and the children so much. I feel like they get a good sense of what, over time, they get a good sense of what is too much and what is not, um, especially if we help looking at the details and give good feedback. Um, you know, my strategy is I agonize over it. So if the parents are out there saying that if, if you folks are agonizing over it, I do that too because it's a hard area. So don't be to don't be critical of yourselves for worrying about it. It is something that we don't know the definitive answer to. So so individualizing it, respecting what your child tells you about being tired or not, um, trying to find ways to help them conserve energy so that they can still participate without getting tired, um, those are sort of the strategies that I think are helpful. I, I, do you think that answers it, Pat, or were you thinking of other Yeah, details? thank you. Uh, and I know, uh, thank you. Sorry, that was wonderful. I, it's hard. I'm sorry. Can I get back a question on that? This is Karen. Um, sure, absolutely. In terms of for bones and the bone milieu, and also in terms of thinking about weight control is obviously always a big concern with the steroids. Is aquatic therapy as safe as we're thinking it is in terms of we know it's not impact for bone, but what kind of guidelines would you give in terms of is it just as a risk for fatiguing and overdoing as it would be other activities? Yeah, I think I think the devil's always in the details. Yes, I think aquatics is probably one of the best exercises out there, but you have to be careful. You could make aquatic ex, uh, therapy resistant. If you added weights and you added, like, flippers that made it hard for a child and they had to work too hard in the pool, you can actually make aquatic therapy too resistive. So you have to remember to not do that. And the other thing about the pool is if the pool is too hot, you know, if you're in a pool that's, that's too hot, you're exhausted you know. afterwards, yeah, we have to avoid that. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. So um, for Danielle, here's a question about neuropsych um, and neuropsych testing. Should we see a doctor that is familiar with DMD? Are there enough of them? Or would any neuropsych doctor be okay and just share risk factors with those doctors? I think that's a great question. Um, neuropsychologists in general, their training is working with um, various chronic medical conditions that um, in understanding brain-based functioning. Um, so I think anyone who um, is considered to be a neuropsychologist and has that certification, regardless of their degree of expertise with um, DMD, would be a great fit. I think we probably don't have enough um, that are experts within Duchenne. Um, we have one in particular at our center that we refer um, primarily to, um, that she understands Duchenne really well, and that can go a long way with recommendations. Um, but I feel that, in general, understanding how the brain works and interpreting the, the testing results um, and developing those recommendations for home and school um, can be of value um, with that background that general neuropsychologists have. Thank you, Danielle. It's always so hard. Uh, we have a clinical trial question. I think this is a balance that many people, many parents worry about. So if you're in the process of testing for one trial, um, would that prevent you from being offered a, a, or a slot in a gene therapy trial before you committed? So if you've got these two trials, and you're, can you screen for both of them and sort of make a decision along the way? And then how do you, how do you figure it out? And how do you choose wh which one to, to, to think about? Which is also a very difficult question for everyone, I think. But um, maybe Han and Eduardo, do you want to take on that question? 
Bye. Yeah. Dr. Kendi, you want to go first? Okay. Uh, so, yeah, it's, you know, I, I feel like a lot of our clinical trials currently is sort of the stepping stone to get to gene therapy. And I'm we're very excited about the progress of gene therapy and and the involvement of um, a handful of companies that are out there. Um, you know, I think that um, when you are um, a mom who or a dad or a parent who is considering enrolling your child in any clinical trial, um, you just have to be realistic and transparent with your physician and your um, principal investigator. You know, I think we all want every child with Duchenne um, to be in the clinical trial and, you know, not only to potentially could benefit your child, but as a community as a whole. So I think the the most important thing is to um, be transparent with your in- intention. Um, so if you're testing for one study and you want it to be in a gene therapy study, um, you know, I, I don't think that there is a um, absolute uh, sort of, no, you cannot try to get into two study and, and see which one works better for you. I think what's more important is to to think about the risk and the benefit of each study for your child and, and sort of what time commitment you, you can um, put forth. So for some of the exon study um, where Alpa knows us very well, you, you come in on a weekly basis. Is that something realistically you can do as a family? Um, so I think it's there's a number of things that you need to, to look at and, and it's sort of a balanced scale. Um, what's your risk, what's your benefit, and what is the most fitting for my family and my child. Um, but, yeah, there's really no, um, you know, absolute guideline to say you can't look at both and you can't try to get into both. Um, but you just have to be transparent. Thank you. Eduardo, do you want to add to that? Yes. Uh, that, um, thank you, Dr. Fan, for that. Um, technically speaking, um, um, I, I, I agree with Dr. Stan that you, the most important part is to be very transparent and have an open conversation about your expectations and how uh, capable you are to participate in the trial depending on the schedule of the trial. Um, and uh, mainly because uh, once you start participating in a, in a study, uh, even though participation in a study is completely voluntary, once you start taking a, a specific investigational product, may uh, either um, an oral drug or an intravenous infusion, that's all of that that's considered an investigational product. Um, some other protocols might have an exclusionary criteria that might prevent you from joining another trial within a specific amount of time, which can range from a month, three months, to six months. Uh, so that's why it's so important to be to make informed decisions uh, in the process before um, you make uh, a final decision on which trial you would prefer to join. Thank you. These are such. I mean, the, the very good news is there. Are, there are many opportunities, and the difficult news is how do you weigh and balance the burden of the studies as well as you know your. We all have assumptions about these studies and, and what we've learned about them and what they we hope the outcome will be, but it is an incredibly difficult decision for families. I'm going to answer this one question. is Can boys do gene therapy while, while taking Valmorolone? They cannot. Um, it is uh, The inclusion criteria are steroids, and so Valmorolone is not an approved drug, uh, and certainly if you're in the middle of Valmorolone study, you can't join a gene therapy study. So. Um, Valmorolone is, is not an inclusion criteria because it is not approved. So, um, and then, uh, w- uh, you know, this is for perhaps o- Eduardo as well. Um, the current research for uh, addressing these boys over 25 is is the um, Santhera study open to boys over 35 or over between 25 and 30? Uh, can you address that one? Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, uh, do you, uh, which specific uh, in third study? 
Yeah, so the Sanfero study, oh, not the Valmore alone study, but the, the um, idevanone study or Rexone, um, that the uh, mitochondrial drug uh, is there in an extension study. Is that including 25-year-olds and above? Uh, I, I think they have I, an open, uh, la- open label extension. Is that right? Yes. Yes, that's correct. And um, I believe uh, I believe the fibrogen study is also available uh, for that patient population. They have, uh, I believe, the fibrogen one is for 12 years old and or and older. And does it go up into 30? Would that? Uh, and maybe it, we it, need it, maybe we need to. Uh, sorry. Yeah, it, it, the criteria is they have to be older than that age, so there's not a cap. Okay, great. So both fibrogen as well as the um, idevanone study would be available to that age group, Cindy. Um, and, and then I'm going to go back to Danielle, and then we'll go to Anne. Uh, so, uh, Danielle, um, one of the big questions is schools, right? Any advice for schools in in on terms of for uh, on terms of with accommodations? A lot of parents are getting pushback from public school systems. And how do we get these schools on board with how to manage the cognitive issues found in Duchenne? Yeah, so unfortunately that is a common and, and challenging question to answer. I think um, with the, the pushback, um, the, the common theme that I hear from families is just really advocacy and um, being able to help educate um, schools on um, the condition and and what the presenting concerns are. I think that's where um, having the neuropsych evals can be helpful, um, especially putting the findings into context and having more specific recommendations for school. Um, Some of our families, um, we have, um, at least within our center, we have a school intervention um, specialist. So within a certain catchment area, we have people that can help with coordinating things in the school meeting or having someone there with the family that can help from an advocacy standpoint and, and helping to facilitate communication with establishing the needed services. This is Thank Laura. you. It's, sorry, Laura, go on. I was going to speak of also to that. Um, and just to know, along with advocacy, um, if there is a school district that maybe has less familiarity um, it can be useful to get um, outside evaluations done maybe by um, some of the teams that have more uh, experience with Duchenne and with the learning differences so that you can bring the results of that testing in to help educate the school districts if they're not familiar. <clears throat> and then if you have definitive testing, that can be used to support um, um, and, and to know, I hate, I hate to say it this way, but also to know the law and you know, if if children need additional support in order to make use of their educational experience, um, that is the law, 9142 and all the subsequent ones, um, that there is support. And so, you know, sometimes you do need to get outside advocacy to to help support in getting the services that are um, rightly deserved. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Laura. I, I, I agree. Think, oh, I'm sorry. Go on. This go is, on. This is I, Alpha. Okay. Sorry, this is Alpa. Just for Georgia, I wanted to make a quick addition. You know, uh, the the social worker at Chola, her name is Allison Pelletary. She is also a very good resource and very helpful when it comes to talking to local schools for any of your child's need, be it in the 504 or IEP. Thank you, Alpa. That's very helpful. I, I will say from my point of view as well, when my boys were in school, it was a, lo- a long time ago, as a parent, it was really difficult. I faced some of the same things that you all are facing. So in addition to all of the things that Karen and Laura and Alpha have suggested, I also suggest making friends. Um, and I would take cookies in to the school or I would send a note to all, all the people involved about how difficult I was finding this, how uh, how fortunate I was to have them on my son's team, and how much I appreciated their their help. I think also creating that human personal interaction is very useful and, and hopefully it will contribute to overall success. Now, I'm going to go on to Anne. So, Anne, we have some genetic testing questions. One is, my daughter's son has DMD and do I, do I the grandma, need to get carrier testing done as the grandma? Um, and then how to do that? And the second one is about an in-frame deletion that looks an in-frame is usually considered on the milder side or on the Becker phenotype side, but what are the things that would lean it toward a di- Duchenne diagnosis? Okay. Uh, so, 
the first question regarding um, your daughter's son who has Duchenne. If your daughter would be the first one who should get carrier testing done, I'm not sure if if, if she already is a confirmed carrier, but I would definitely start the carrier testing with her, and and we would just need to look for the specific mutation that was found in her son and your grandson. If your daughter is found to be a carrier, I do think it's worthwhile for yourself to be tested to see if you're a carrier just because of the cardiac issues, but also because if you have sisters or, you know, nieces, if you're a carrier, they could be as well. So it's important to know for the rest of the family. And in terms of how to get that done, it can be done through our decode program. Um, you would, you could go to our website, the parentprojectmd.org and under the about Duchenne section is where you'll find the decode Duchenne information. Or if you just want to email me directly, I'm happy to kind of walk you through that process. Again, my email is Ann, A-N-N, at parentprojectmd.org. Um, you would need to get a local doctor involved because your local doctor, whether it's family practice or OBGYN or um you know, GP, they would need to actually submit the application for the free testing, but it's really quite simple. It can be done online, um, and we can help you through that process. And the second question about in-frame deletions that are typically Becker, but sometimes Duchenne, there's different factors there that can cause that to happen, some of which we don't clearly understand, but sometimes it has to do with where the deletion is in the gene, like if it's very early in the gene, even though it's in frame, if it's at the very beginning of the gene, it typically results in a more Duchenne presentation. Um, like I said, there's other factors we don't quite understand, and it could be that there are modifying factors as well, so actually changes in other genes that are modifying severity. There's a lot of research going on in that area now, and we don't certainly have all of the answers yet. Um, but again, I'm happy if, if you would want to share the report with me, I could do a little digging and see what I can find out. But oftentimes, even even if the genetic test report says it's in frame or out of frame, your doctor is going to go based primarily on your clinical symptoms. So if, if it's in frame, but your child is presenting more Duchenne-like, they'll tend to weigh more on the clinical presentation than the genetic test report. I mean, they take it all into consideration, but um, it, it can just vary with every child, even with children within the same family. And I think a lot of that has to do with the modifying genes that we don't quite understand. Thank you, Ann. I think that we've covered all the questions that we had to come in. I so thank all of you for joining us today, and I thank you, uh, Dr. Fawn, Dr. Figueroa, Laura, Dr. Case, Dr. Graff, and Dr. Lautner for joining us, and thank you, Anne, and thank you, Kaylin, for, for doing this, and thank you very much, Alpha, for what you're doing in, for the local families. We appreciate your help. We appreciate all you do for us, and we wish you well, and hopefully we'll be able to see each other very soon. Thanks for connecting with us today. Thank Please you. Know if you have Thanks questions. Everybody. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.